Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories. We have stories that should thrill you a little and chill you a little. It's amazing. What you'll hear are adventures sent in by you guys, classic stories from the pulp mags, and episodes from the golden age of radio. We have special segments like Ghost Stories with Sylvia. That's amazing. And these are your stories. So settle in for the next hour and enjoy the show. One more thing. You just might want to prepare yourself to be taken away from today. Another five-minute mystery. This five minute mystery is being brought to you by the bus. The bus? Yes, that's right. I just don't get this one. The John Gordon quote. Okay. Don't waste your energy on those who don't get on your bus. Who is John Gordon? Good morning, Chef. Morning, Deputy. Ted just called in and said he'd be late. Springfield bus from Cleveland broke down just outside of Cleveland and won't be in till 11 o'clock. Well, I guess you and I can handle what little business we get here in Springville until then. Oh, Sheriff's Office. Speaking. James Coburn shot. Be right there. Sheriff, the bullet entered his right temple just over the eye, passing through the head and made its exit from the back of the neck. I knew this would happen to James. You uh, knew this would happen, Miss Alice? Yes. You see, Sheriff, some man in Cleveland had attempted to blackmail James because of an earlier romance, and James had threatened to turn the blackmailer over to the police. Because of that, his life was threatened. I had him come here to Springville to hide out for a while. Deputy, uh... Have any strange men been reported in town the last few days, or have you seen any suspicious characters that might have been trying to locate James Coburn? Oh, haven't heard of a soul, except some bum that must have dropped off a freight. A short, swarthy-looking guy. That sounds just like the Cleveland man. James described him to me one day. Don't recall anyone saying he'd inquired about Coburn. Hmm. James always seemed like a pretty upright man to me. Oh, James was a very quiet man, Sheriff. He was just unfortunate enough to have been tied up with this affair in his youth. And then this... this gangster had to try a shakedown on him and ruin all our happiness. We... we were to be married. We were going to be married tomorrow and go to Cincinnati to live. James had a job offered him there. I'm sorry. This has been a shock to you then. Yes, it has, Sheriff. James had written me last week. He asked me to come on the 8.30 bus today. Then we were going on to Cincinnati this afternoon. Oh, I was so happy. I packed all my things and left Cleveland on the bus early this morning. I rushed right out here only to... to find him dead. Oh, if only he'd gone to Cincinnati months ago as I begged him. It would have been just the same, Miss Alice. Well, it couldn't have been. He'd have been safe there. No. No, you'd have tracked him there and murdered him, just like you did here. Do you know why the sheriff accused Alice of murdering James Coburn? In just a moment, we shall find out. But first... I think I know this one. And to what do we owe this rapid onset of mental acuity? Well, it has to do with the bus. The one that goes round and round. Exactly. It's all about the timing. Do buses and trains run on time? No. Everyone knows that buses run on wheels while trains move along tracks. But they do break down. I see. I highly doubt it. I was being nice. When have you ever been nice? Good point. And now for the solution to our mystery. Alice, James Coburn was shot by someone facing him as he sat in the chair. 
Obviously, someone from whom he didn't fear violence, therefore not a man. You were the blackmailer, if anyone was, Alice. He probably laughed at your threats today, went back to reading, and you shot him. You said that you arrived this morning at 8.30 on the bus from Cleveland. You couldn't have. That bus broke down, and one of my own deputies is still stranded outside of Cleveland on that bus. Come along. Not a man. I'm gonna kill that sheriff. Well, O.P., then you too would go to jail. For once I agree with Ron. Not my problem. Let's not kill anyone today. Alice was wrong, and she will pay for what she did. Here, here. Justice served. Is that you said? Hello, and welcome to the podcast. Today's show promises to be a captivating journey through the realm of cinema and the supernatural. We begin with an exploration of the iconic Alien film franchise. We review an audiobook made from a lost script that has gained a cult following among fans. Get ready for a thrilling ride as we uncover mysteries and secrets of this long-lost screenplay. In the second part of the show, we have three extraordinary stories sent in by our talented listeners. First up is a captivating work of fiction by Abigail Atkinson that will transport you to a world of imagination and wonder. Next, we have the peculiar tale of a statue of an angel that keeps falling, inexplicably defying the laws of gravity. And finally, we'll unravel the enigma of a static shadow that seems to haunt a young woman's life. These stories are sure to leave you intrigued and spellbound. To conclude the show, we present a thought-provoking science fiction story titled The Creature Inside. This gripping tale explores the mind's potential when given unlimited resources. What would happen if our consciousness could expand beyond the confines of our physical bodies? The creature inside offers a glimpse into a possible answer. So, sit back, relax, and prepare to be captivated by the wonders of the human mind and the boundless possibilities of the universe. Yeah, I know that was all a bit too much, but it was fun to write. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, computer, Kindle, whatever you have, you can listen to Audible on it. So, what am I listening to right now? Alien 3 an audible original drama. Now, I'm sure that you remember or have seen the cult hit movie Alien from 1979. It was followed up by another successful film in 1986 called Aliens. These were some of the best movies for horror science fiction ever and the franchise continues on today. But did you know that a third script was written in 1987? While it was never made into a movie, the script was leaked online and it became a cult classic. Audible got the rights to it and has made it into a two hour plus audio production starring much of the original cast of that 1986 film, Aliens. It is called Alien 3. Audible has brought William Gibson's script to life to mark the 40th anniversary of the birth of the Alien franchise. Alongside a full cast, Michael Bean and Lance Hendrickson reprise their iconic roles as Corporal Hicks and Bishop. 
this terrifying dramatization is a chance to experience the untold story as a completely immersive audio experience. The story begins with the Suluko on its return journey from LV-426. On board are the cryogenically frozen crew that survived, Ripley, Hicks, Newt, and Bishop. Here is a brief bit of what you can expect to hear from Alien 3. Ripley and I survived. Newt had now herself been abducted. She was deep inside the damaged atmosphere processor. Its failing reactor going critical. We urgently needed to make our escape in the spare dropship, which I had summoned from the Sulaco. But Ripley had formed an attachment with the child. Bishop! How much time? Plenty. 26 minutes. We're not leaving! We're not? I flew the dropship into the atmosphere processor tower, buffeted by turbulence from the reactor vents. I put it down on an upper landing platform. Hicks was strapped into a flight seat, badly burned by the creature's acid blood. Ripley was taping a pulse rifle and flamethrower together, stuffing other weapons and ammunition into a bag. Ripley! I don't want to hear about it, Bishop. She's alive. There's still time. In 19 minutes, this area is going to be a cloud of vapor the size of Nebraska. Hicks! Don't let him leave. We ain't going anywhere. See you, Hicks. Dwayne. It's Dwayne. Ellen. Don't be gone long, Ellen. This is not going to end well. Just keep the dropship on station, Bishop. And pass me the medical kit. You need bandages? Painkiller. And plenty of it. Now you can travel with them to hear the complete story of what really happened in Alien 3. Here's what Audible has set up for us. They are offering a free audiobook and 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories, and you can get your free book today. Thank you, Audible. And now it's time for your stories. These are your stories sent by you for you. Our first story for this time is a work of fiction sent in by 14-year-old Abigail Atkinson. Now, if that's not a writer's name, I don't know what is. To Abigail, I say I think you could have a real future in writing, and you've already got the name. Here is Abigail's story that she has titled, Future Gadgets. Congratulations, Professor! Thank you, Vice Chancellor, although you should be careful waving that champagne around. There's a lot of sensitive equipment in here. Yes, it's an impressive array. I'm just amazed that you imagined to secure the funding for a temporal displacement research facility, given the financial straits that the university finds itself in. Oh, there's always a way of funding a project that grabs the public's attention. Big name brands like to see themselves as supporting big ideas. And the big idea is time travel? Ah, well, yes. That is, of course, the ultimate goal, said the professor, flicking a used cocktail stick into the nearby bin. But don't hold your breath. I certainly don't expect any concrete results within my lifetime. Realistically, it could be hundreds of years before a fizzling noise a sputter of electronic sparks, and finally a damp plop that sounded like boiling custard. And there, in the corner of the room, wreathed in blue smoke, stood a tall, academic-looking young man with a Mohican haircut, wearing a white-tailed coat over a pink shirt. He blinked twice and peered around the room. Ah, uh, Professor Armstrong? The entire room gaped in astonishment before the professor stepped forward uncertainly. I'm Armstrong, 
he said in a shaky voice. And you are? Ice off de future, said the young man. Ice de boss sibid, go to tempo displace residential FAC, me name Oswo. And Professor Armstrong, we been done it man. We been done to time trav. And ice come back into historic, where it all began, to give up the good news. Somewhere in the back of the room, someone began to clap, tentatively at first, then with greater conviction. Before long, the entire room was cheering and applauding. That's incredible, said the professor, shaking his head. What's the date from where you come from? How long did it take? I so to year 1046, post newage, said Oswo. And I not stay but a ten men, else no go back, but I want giving you a view o' the futurings. Post new age, replied the professor. When is that? How long into the future for us? Um, I don't know, said Oswo. New age, like his ode along back. So how did you solve it? What was the equation that put you on the right track? Was the... But the professor was elbowed aside by the vice-chancellor, who envisioned the TV interviews, the bottomless funding, the chat shows, the vastly improved rankings, the gongs, the honors, the fame that would surely follow the revelations that would clearly need to be prized out of this academic half-wit. So, Mr. Oswell, he said confidently, welcome to the 21st century. Uh, <laughs> he added after a pause. And what can you tell us about our own future? What happens to the planet? Do we beat global warming? How do we solve the energy crisis? Who will lead our nations? Oswu shook his head sadly. I'm Sazi, man, I sibid, I no histabod. No politibod. Don't know the dates, the names, Sazi. The vice chandler looked nonplussed, but decided to change his track. Okay, well, you must have some exciting new technology in 1046, whenever that was. Do you have anything you can show us? A broad grin spread over Oswald's face. Why show man? I's got Oda Mixmacher, for show. He slid back his sleeve to reveal a broad bracelet-like device that encased most of his forearm. It resembled a piece of Roman armor and was made of a substance that looked like smoky brown glass. It featured a single blue light in its otherwise featureless surface. The assembly crowded around for a better look. That's most interesting, said the vice counselor. What does it do? It make everything, said Oswald. Looky, I's gonna cook ye as a meat o' burger. He tapped the side of the device, and the blue light increased in intensity, then ran up and down the length of his arm, and then it returned to its original position, and began flashing a dull orange. Um, said Oswo. What's yes MZ login? Are what? said the Chancellor. MZ, yes got no MZ net? I think it's some kind of network, said the Professor. Perhaps an advanced form of Wi-Fi? No, Mr. Oswo. We have no MZ network here. Oh, geez, man. Suck, yes. Well, looky, I's got Oda Pengo. Yes, love that. And from his inside pocket, he drew a slim pen-like object that supported a steel ball at one end and a twisting knob at the other. Oh, geez, he said. The power gone. Yes, got's fusion? Two sex. Oda Pengo up and run. I'm sorry, Mr. Oswo. We have not yet developed fusion power in this century. Oh, man. Geez, no. Saucy man, everybody got fusion in 1046. But not here, said the vice chancellor. Look, there must be something you can show us or tell us anything, anything at all. Saucy man, said Oswald. But looky, me ten men gone. I's just grab vid like for Oda home guys. Oswald touched a finger to his temple and a faint whirling sound accompanied by a shift in his eye as the iris opened to reveal a tiny lens. Smile, he commanded, and the crowd of scientists, university officials, and freeloaders all smiled gamely as Oswo swept his gaze across the room left to right before disappearing in a puff of blue smoke. End of Future Devices, written by Abigail Atkinson. Well, Abigail, that was a creative story. I loved it, and I thank you for sharing it with us. I think you have a real future in writing stories, if that's what you want to do. I will admit I had a real problem reading the part of Oswo. I hope that my solution was okay. 
This story comes from Bonnie Hernandez, who lives in Grand Prairie, Texas. She writes, Hello, Ron. I have enjoyed the month of Spooky and wanted to join in with a story. I know that this might not make the cut because it's so simple, but it did happen and that was enough for me. It was Halloween night, which means that we had already had our share of ghosts, monsters, fairy princesses, and even Batman. I was in my room getting ready for bed when I heard this loud crash come from the doorway of our home. I went out to where it was and saw that my prized angel sculpture had fallen onto the floor. The odd thing was is that I had tied a string to the angel to prevent it from falling, and the only way for it to be taken down is by taking the string off by pulling it up and over a hook. There's no way it could just fall. The string would have to be cut or broken, and it wasn't. I didn't think much of it, and the angel was not damaged, so I started heading back to bed. A minute later, my roommate screamed. I ran to her bedroom, and she was standing in the middle of the floor, brushing something off herself. I ran to her and asked what was wrong. She said she had heard the crash as well and was getting up to investigate. She felt a cold breeze that sent chills through her and then saw spiders all over her. I flipped on the ceiling light and we looked around. Not a single spider anywhere to be found. My roommate to this day still swears that they were there. That happened last Halloween, and nothing has happened since. I couldn't help but think the whole thing was somehow connected. It was pretty creepy. It left us both wondering what was going to happen this Halloween. Maybe we'll just plan to be somewhere else. Bonnie Hernandez, Grand Prairie, Texas. Well, first off, I sent Bonnie a note to see if anything did happen this Halloween. She was true to her word and said that they were both at a party until way after midnight. So, no spooky stuff this year that they know of. Thank you, Bonnie, for your story. It was pretty amazing, and you shouldn't have worried if it was good enough. Our last story is a short one from MaxSweet302. Sorry, folks, that's all I got. So, MaxSweet, if you want credit, send me your name. Here is the post. Hello, Ron. Thank you for your shows. They are amazing. I have eye migraines, which means I see an aura, but don't feel any real pain. I was lying in bed, and I was seeing shadows moving around the walls, thinking maybe I was having a migraine. I really think I was. On the wall next to me was one static shadow. It was a bit stranger than the others. I was wondering why this shadow was static while the others moved with my eyes, and suddenly I felt a cold breath on my hand. At that moment, my hand was too far from my face for it to have been my own breath. I freaked out, ran to my parents' bed, where I spent the rest of the night. I'm not sure if it was paranormal, but it was quite disturbing. Max Sweet 302 Well, I would say that is disturbing, Max Sweet, and thank you for sharing your story. Remember, if you want me to post your real name, just send it to me. That's it for this time. I want to thank everyone that sent stories in this time. And please remember, I need more of your stories. Our featured story comes from the pages of the 1960s pulp magazine scene. The 1960s were infamous for its counterculture, folk music, civil rights, the Vietnam War, radical youth, hippies, campus unrest, the generation gap, and to a special few, the dangerous visions of the new wave in science fiction. It mutated into a psychedelic sci-fi with a crop of brand new writers. Science fiction tuned in, turned on, and detonated with stories like Stranger in a Strange Land, 
and Frank Herbert's Dune. As NASA rocketed towards the final frontier, science fiction warped its way through new territories of inner space and the planet Gaia. Science fiction grew up in the 1960s and moved away from its pulp adventure adolescence, seeking to explore, experiment, and radicalize. Hence, our story for today. It is titled, The Creature Inside and was written by John Michael Sharkey, a.k.a. Jack Sharkey. You might know that name if you read any of the Addams Family novels in the 1960s. The story is about the power of the mind if given unlimited resources. It appeared in the magazine Worlds of Tomorrow in December 1963 under the tagline, The room was small, but it held the universe, and Norcrist had no place in it. Here is The Creature Inside, and it is read for us by the very talented Ben Tucker. How much do they tell you about the fix we're in? said Dr. Alan Burgess to his visitor. Lieutenant Jerry Norcris shook his head. They said you'd fill me in. They said it was urgent. Burgess paused, lighted a cigarette, then belatedly offered one to Jerry, who declined. Well, he said, interspersing his words with short, nervous puffs of smoke. About a year ago, I stumbled on a way to reverse the process of an electroencephalograph, to play pre-recorded thoughts and experiences to a man's mind. You zoologists with your contact process for penetrating newly discovered fauna's minds will be familiar with the process, luckily for us. Jerry eyed him. Go on. My development involves an infinitely selective feedback. We give the subject a saturating dose of inflowing concepts. His mind is free to choose among them and to link them. Take bigness, affluence, and danger, for instance. The subject puts them together and fleshes them out. He could experience a large, expensive fission bomb falling onto him, or he could be sacrificed to an immense golden idol, or or anything that his inner mind chose. I begin to understand, said Jerry. The overlay influences all the senses. The subject thinks he's really undergoing whatever he conjures up, and you use it for therapy, letting him work off his aggressions and frustrations in what seems to him an actual universe. Correct, except for the tense, said Alan Burgess. I was doing that until Monday of this week. He leaned forward across the desk. We screened the subjects carefully because certain psychoses could be disastrous to the subject in my device. Paranoia, for instance. The man would be amid unutterable horrors with danger on every side. He'd emerge a gibbering idiot if he didn't die of heart failure first. Emerge? asked Jerry, frowning. I'd assume you used a helmet, such as we do in contact. Burgess sighed. Unfortunately, I am paying the penalty of lone wolf experimentation. I wish I'd had the sense to route the input to the brain through a helmet, but I didn't. Instead, I installed the person in an observation room. The influencing factor was nutrition. Intravenous feedings wouldn't have served the purpose of the observer. Sometimes the subject's choice of foodstuffs is significant, he had to be let move about, his mind in a make-believe world, his body actually moving about a room we could see into. So, I had an atomic duplicator installed. The hospital got one last year for making radium, turning cancerous growths into normal flesh, regrowing bone and the like. Should the subject then grow hungry, the duplicator would be triggered by his conviction of eating. In his mind, he might be... Hanging from a branch by his tail, for instance, the duplicator's production of bananas, coconuts, or whatever would give us a further clue to his state of mind. You see? So far, sound enough, Dr. Burgess, said Jerry. So, what went wrong? I assumed something did, or I wouldn't be here. We made a terrible error. We tried observing a man named Anthony Mawson in our gadget. I diagnosed his case as simple inferiority complex. My fault. Wrong diagnosis. Mawson has megalomania. A gorgeous case of it. Of course, he's not the first such case to fool psychiatrists. You see, his outward shyness, soft-spoken voice, and general gawkishness is due to feeling superior to others, not the reverse. He feels smarter, stronger, braver, etc. than everybody else in creation. But he also feels that nobody knows it but himself. Hence his 
indrawing, his brooding, taciturn gentility. Jerry Norcris prodded. What happened with Mawson when you put him in your machine? I don't know, said Burgess. No one's been able to see into the machine since he entered it on Monday. He couldn't have escaped? No, I wish he had. Anthony Mawson is still in that room, in his own private universe, and we can't get him out of it. We've tried cutting the power to the machine. The opacity inside the room remains. We sent two men in after him. They never came out. How could he possibly? asked Jerry. Burgess shook his head. We can only guess. Our theory is that he's used the duplicator to make the entire room self-sustaining. Normally, we could wait till he runs out of material to feed the duplicator, but we can't wait on the lives of those two men, nor can we chance his expanding his universe. Norcris frowned. Expanding it? Burgess nodded. By perhaps feeding the duplicator with the room itself. With a pickaxe, he can start hewing down the very walls, or even have the duplicator build a robot that will take care of its need for material to build with. Against this development, we have surrounded the room completely with a force shield, limiting his outward progress to two feet of concrete in any direction. But the room is approximately 30 feet square and 20 feet high. With all that mass, he could exist in there for years. And my job is to get him out, said Jerry. Yes, the government feels that a contact specialist's the only kind of man to send into this madman's world. You men are used to extra-somatic experiences, and you've learned to live with danger without losing your heads. Well, said Jerry, getting up, I guess that sums up the situation sufficiently. Burgess nodded sadly. Any further briefing is useless. Impossible, really. I've told you the situation, and you can certainly imagine the danger. But as for the solution, well... You'll just have to feel your way, and do whatever you think best. Jerry paused beside Burgess at the door to the hall. One thing, Doctor. When I get into the influence of the machine, what kind of universe will I be in? Mine or Mawson's? I can only theorize on that, said Burgess. My guess would be that you'll find both in there, one vying for supremacy over the other. This fight won't be man to man. It will be... Universe against universe. Two. There had been no sensation at all as Jerry stepped through the flat sheet of grayness in the doorway. No more physical awareness than a blind man might feel when passing through the beam of a powerful light. Perhaps there was a slight sensation of the mere presence of the energies that kept the opacity in existence. But that sensation, Jerry knew, was psychological, not actual. Although... He realized as his world became an infinity of opalescent gray. In this place, a psychological awareness will be no different from a genuine physical sensation. Better be careful of what I think about in this psychokinetic fog. The thought was barely formulated when the grayness changed. It became moist against his flesh and started swirling in tendrils about him. Damn it, be careful, he belatedly cautioned his mind. Now the stuff is fog. Ahead of him in the swirling mist, a brighter-than-gray glow led his footsteps forward. He found himself standing beneath an overhanging marquee. Its black undersurface was runneled with condensed moisture amid the garish naked bulbs that haloed the wet cement sidewalk. A red-coated doorman, resplendent behind rows of bright brassy buttons, gave him a smile as he pulled open the door that led to the club. Jerry nodded and went inside. Thick crimson carpet cushioned his footfalls as he moved cautiously through an empty lobby, then down a white marble staircase toward the ballroom. Dimly, he was aware that the band at the far end of the mammoth room was playing music. What song he didn't know until a chance courting reminded him of a popular song of the day, at which point that suddenly was the tune. The tables ringing the dance floor were covered with bright linen and shining silver. The tables were empty of patrons, however, until Jerry casually thought, I should think business would be better. Suddenly a horde of laughing couples appeared in the chairs with hurrying waiters bringing champagne, trays, and menus to their guests. The men wore tuxedos, the women were in evening dress. He looked suddenly at himself and saw that his uniform was now the official dress uniform of the Space Corps. Before he could conquer it, his mind voiced a quick wish that he shouldn't be dining alone, and then a girl was rising from her place at the table beside the dance floor, hurrying to greet him, hands outstretched. Her fingers were small and strong and warm. 
She smiled up at him. Jerry, darling. Despite her being only arm's length from him, he could not see her well at all. His impression was merely one of youth, loveliness, and girlness. But then, as he tried to ascertain precisely what she looked like, hidden corners of his mind began to supply each detail an instant before his conscious quest for it. And Jerry, in a few moments, was suddenly staggered with delighted shock. Very few men are privileged to find a girl who lives up to all their dreams of perfection in a woman. Hair as soft as cobweb, as fluffy as dancing clouds, as golden as flowing honey, cascaded down about a slender alabaster throat and dyed in golden ripples on smooth white shoulders. Eyes, the rich brown of raw chocolate, gazed serenely at him from under red-gold brows and jet lashes, their patrician serenity permeated with a touch of twinkling impishness. Her lips were soft, and not unlike berry-stained velvet. Sweet and warm and tempting, her mouth generous and tilted at the corners and to a smile of greeting, obviously the result of her subduing a frank laugh of joy at seeing him. Geometrically perfect teeth flashed white as porcelain between her lips. Her gown was a shimmering midnight blue, highlighted with random sprinkles of brightly coruscating gems. Even as his lips parted to ask her name, Jerry knew it and spoke it softly. Carol. Listen, she said softly, tilting her head toward where the band had begun a new song. Swift, urgent, and rapturous, it floated through the room, surrounded the two of them, took possession of them. Then Carol was in his arms, and Jerry was dancing out onto the floor with her. The other couples were a blur of forgotten figures that swayed. Jerry knew the melody. It was their song, their own private love song the one that had been playing on the night when they both knew, suddenly, that there could be no one else for either of them but the other. As they returned to their table, Jerry realized that Carol was now garbed in a white peasant blouse and bright flowered flaring skirt, and that her hair was drawn back at the temples to expose her ears, now adorned with golden hoops. The table was in a lattice-backed booth, covered with a red and white checkered cloth. The inner surface of the table held salt, pepper, grated cheese, and breadsticks, matching cruets of pale olive oil and dark vinegar. The band was now a five-man gypsy ensemble. "'Remember the first time we came here, Jerry?' asked Carol, her eyes at once upon his face, and distant, dreamy. As she smiled, Jerry noticed with dull horror that one of her eyes was perceptibly lower than the other. The teeth she flashed his way were mottled with brown stains. She took hold of his fingers with her own. "'Carol!' he said shakily, staring at the knuckly red-rod hands that clutched at his. What's happening? Happening? She said, her voice a raucous croak of amusement. Nothing's happening. In fact, you're probably one of the dullest guys I ever got stuck with. She tossed her head petulantly. Coarse, straw-colored hair flipped away from her thick neck. Her breath was sour with wine and miasmic with garlic. Carol! he cried. Don't whine! She snapped viciously. I hate a guy who whines. With that, she shoved out of the booth and waddled toward the rear of the coffee house, one hand scratching at a bulge of flesh that overhung the too tight girdle. Her black leotards were twisted and dull as she passed the flashing rainbow lights of the brassy jukebox. Jerry shoved away from the table, overturning his coffee in its cracked china cup, and he wove his way through the reek and smoke toward the door through which she had vanished. When he got there, the door was a peeling poster on a bare brick wall, advertising some long-forgotten show. His fingers scrabbled on rough mortar for a moment. Then he turned and paced back to his cot, where he flopped on his back in the long shadows of the bars. Norcris, said the guard, coming into the cell. This is it! The brass uniform buttons flashed brightly. Strong hands were lifting him from the cot, dragging him down a long corridor toward a steel door. As they got there, the door opened wide and Jerry saw the gaping maw of hungry steel gears, while behind him a man's voice droned prayers. Then, before the guard could shove Jerry forward into that waiting mechanical mouth, Jerry noticed the odd shimmer of grayness that lay between himself and the waiting teeth, and he remembered that he was in a world of illusion. At precisely that moment he knew beyond a doubt that those waiting jaws were illusion in form only. An atomic duplicator does not have to chew its intake, it merely dissolves the atomic bonds with the rays that flash between its power plates on either side of the disruption platform. The waiting mouth and teeth were mere symbols in Jerry's mind of what was about to occur. They were unreal, but they could be fatal. 
He shut his eyes, shoved backwards with his feet, and thought of Carol as he had first glimpsed her. When he opened his eyes once more, she was standing before him in her ballroom gown again, and the band was just beginning to play their song once more. Jerry, she said, taking his arm, dance with me. No, we're in danger here. Come on, I'll get your coat. We've got to get away quickly. A spark of alarm showed briefly in her eyes. Then she nodded wordlessly and hurried up the marble staircase with him to the lobby. Jerry got her coat from the check room, a marvelous silvery fur that covered her from neck to waist. And then they were headed out into the fog together. Good evening to you, sir, said the doorman, eyes and buttons bright. Jerry grunted and led Carol off down the street into the fog. Where are we going? she asked, breathlessly trying to keep pace. Away, I hope, he said. Even their movement from the ballroom could be sheer illusion. Jerry tried moving from the club entrance in the exact reverse of the motion in which he'd first approached it, trying to achieve the real doorway that led from the experimental room into the antiseptic hospital corridor where Burgess waited. But the fog continued to be fog. It would not take on the form of that intangible gray shimmering that guarded the entrance to Anthony Mawson's megalomaniac universe. If I could only see where... he began. Then every tendril of fog was gone. Before him lay the cold blackness of outer space, pinpointed with hard, unwinking stars. Jerry recoiled from the viewplate, shaken, and turned around to see Carol. Her eyes were wide and startled as she glanced about at the metal confines of the control cabin. Jerry had just time enough to think how incongruous she looked in her fur jacket and long blue-black gown. And then she was clothed in the neat gray uniform of the wasp, trim short-sleeved shirt, and sharply creased shorts. Jerry, said Carol. She slipped her arm through his, staring at the infinite stars in the viewplate. What are we running from? He tried to think, but could not remember. There's some danger behind us. We have to get away from it, Carol. It means complete destruction if we're caught. Carol stared helplessly at the stars in the viewplate. But where are we running to? Jerry shook his head. Impossible to tell. Not without the help of a good astrogator. Out in space, stars shift and magnitudes change. I'm not even qualified to guess. Sire, said the astrogator, handing a clipboard to Jerry. We can reach any of these seven stars in a few hours. Just tell me where you'd prefer to go. Jerry turned to the man, resplendent in his neat Space Corps uniform, jacket bright with brass buttons. When he tried to focus upon the man's features, he could detect nothing. We'd better choose the quickest trip, Jerry said, after a moment's indecision. No telling how much fuel we have left. The astrogator nodded. I'm afraid that's out of my department, all right, sir. But if you'd care to check the tanks... Without waiting for a reply, the man turned and began to pick his way carefully toward the rear of the spaceship, stepping from girder to girder. The floor, Jerry noticed idly as he followed, was exposed to open space between the curving ribs of steel that formed the framework of the ship. Careful now, he said, helping Carol along from one to the other. That's vacuum out there. We don't want to fall through. Ahead of Jerry, the implacable man with the brass buttons was nearly to the steel door masking the blast chamber, where the components of fuel were mingled and ignited. Jerry, giddily aware of every hazardous step over the squares of star-speckled blackness, kept one hand on Carol's arm, the other on her chessboard. "'Don't spill any of the men,' she cautioned as the diminutive plastic figures danced and rattled on the board. "'I don't intend to search the whole cosmos for a pawn.' "'Here you go, sir,' said the politely insistent astrogator, opening the steel door. Before Jerry yawned an oval of intense white flame— the radiating heat crisping against his skin and hair. The fission rate, Jerry mumbled, consulting his wristwatch. I've got to time it, or I won't be able to calculate the amount of fuel still left in the bulkheads. Count it by steps, sir, suggested the astrogator. One, said Jerry, stepping out toward the blind coruscation of heat. Two, he said, feeling carefully for the next girder. Then the toe of his boot slipped from the metal, and he realized, with a horrible lancing of adrenaline through his abdomen, that he was falling out the opening between the girders. The only salvation would be a shove with his still-braced rear foot, but that would carry him directly into the inferno of burning fuel. An eternity of falling through icy vacuum against an instant of intolerable searing pain. The fire, gasped Jerry, toppling in 
inexorable slow motion toward starry darkness, a cloud of twirling chess pieces orbiting about his head. I've got to make it into the fire. He tensed the muscles of the laggard leg for the spring that would carry him to destruction. And then he saw that the chess pieces were shimmering gray, and the oval frame of the doorway to the flaming fuel was shimmering gray. And even what had seemed hot, white, burning was cold, gray, waiting mist. And with a yell of remembrance, Jerry clamped shut his eyes and let himself plunge downward into nothingness. 3. Are you all right, Norcris? Jerry blinked slowly, then focused on the face of Dr. Alan Burgess. He found himself lying on a narrow, white-sheeted cart in the corridor outside the room where all the trouble had begun. Mawson, he said groggily. Is he... Burgess nodded warily. Still in there, in full control of his one-man universe. What happened, Norcris? You came tumbling out that door like a wild man, clawing the air and yelling. Then you went into shock. You've been unconscious for two hours. I... I thought I was falling, Jerry admitted. The last thing I remember is stepping through the open space between a spaceship's supporting girders. What open space? said Burgess, frowning curiously. Jerry shook his head. There isn't any such thing, but something happens to the logic in that room. It's like having a dream doctor. Things that would startle you in everyday life seem correct, even familiar. But there's a kind of pattern to events. At first I'm in my universe and mostly in control, then little fragments of my pseudo-reality start slipping, changing into other things. The changes seem perfectly normal to me. Then all at once the guy with the brass buttons turns up and I've managed in the nick of time twice to realize that I was about to be sent or led between the disrupting plates of your atomic duplicator. The man with the brass buttons, Burgess said slowly. Do you think it's Mawson? Either him or a robot he's made to keep his machine fed. When Burgess scowled, Jerry shrugged and appended. It's his machine for all practical purposes. He's the boss of that hungry electronic monster, Doctor. However the hospital feels about it. This Carol, is she a real woman or a figment of your imagination? Wishful thinking. She's real enough, Jerry sighed. She's the personal secretary of the entire space zoology program. I'd take her out sometimes. There's nothing special between us. But you wish there were, said Burgess. Jerry stared at him. What makes you think that? Burgess tilted his head toward the room where Mawson still maintained control. Your vision's in there. You must think a lot of her. You can kid yourself consciously, but nearly all you underwent in there came straight from your subconscious. And a uh, subconscious just doesn't know how to lie. Jerry changed the subject. What's our next move? How soon can I go back after Mawson? You can't. Mawson's knowledge of this Carol can easily be turned to your disadvantage. He can use her to lead you to dissolution in there. No, it's much too risky. You're lucky you got out when you did. But what about Mawson, then? Burgess tried to look confident. He failed. We can ring up your headquarters and ask for another man. Or, if worse comes to worse, we can partition off this part of the hospital and just sit it out until Mawson runs out of atomic building blocks. Which may take years, Jerry reminded him. Burgess turned his palms upward. What else can we do? Send me again, said Jerry. I know the score pretty well now. I know what to watch out for. I'm sure that with one more try, I can get Mawson out of there. Sorry, Burgess said, shaking his head. As a medical man, I cannot permit it. You've had a bad shot. We'll try someone else, if your outfit will send someone else, and see what happens. If he fails, or if they won't supply us with any more men, then, well, you can try again in a few weeks, if you're still game, but not now. Doctor, in a few weeks, Mawson will be so well in control of that universe that he may find a way to block the entrance. Have you thought of that? His universe is not a real one, Burgess began. But that duplicator is real enough. It can make anything he decides he needs. And at any time, he may get the bright idea of simply mounting his machine right at the entrance. So anyone stepping into that gray field will be powdered into atoms instantly. That's 
True enough, admitted Burgess. But my diagnosis still stands. For now, you are off this assignment. When I feel you're ready, assuming nothing else has succeeded meantime, I'll contact you at the base. How do you know I won't be off on some other planet by then? Asked Jerry bitterly. I don't, said Burgess. I hope you're not, but there isn't anything further I can do about it. I'm sorry. And what do I do in the meantime? Burgess grinned. Call up this Carol and go out on the town. Jerry shook his head at the last part. No, thanks. I prefer Carol to know nothing about it. Burgess shrugged and gave it up. All right, Norcris. Rest here till you feel stronger, then you're free to go. Then he was striding off down the corridor. After a bit, Jerry sat up cautiously, let the slight giddiness subside, then swung his legs off the side of the cart and got down. Behind him, the door to Mawson's universe stood open on its wall of grayness. Jerry stared thoughtfully at it, then saw that the two interns who were guarding the opposite ends of this section of the hospital corridor were hesitantly half-starting toward him. Jerry knew he could be through that doorway and into the grayness before they got within ten feet of him. Four. Then his shoulders slumped and he turned and walked toward the elevators. Burgess was right. He felt worn out and uninclined to make grandstand plays. Besides, he thought, thumbing the elevator button, it would be nice to see the real Carol again, after her nebulous pseudo-self. He wanted very much to put his arms around a girl who wouldn't suddenly turn into something horrible in his embrace. The steel door slid open before him and the elevator boy leaned out to check the corridor for other passengers. Down? he said. Jerry nodded and started into the elevator. Then he hesitated and looked back toward the room where Mawson reigned supreme, then back at the elevator boy. Say, he said uncertainly, that's a strange outfit for an elevator attendant in a hospital. I'd have expected an orderly in an all-white get-up. The boy glanced down at his uniform, the bright blue pants, shined black shoes, and scarlet jacket, bright with twin rows of brass buttons. I suppose it is, he said. But I don't usually run this elevator. I'm from the hotel next door. I'm just doing this while the regular guy takes his coffee break. Jerry hesitated, then stepped toward the waiting elevator with its pale gray walls, and stopped again. His hand went to his forehead bewilderingly. There's something, he said. Then Carol was beside him, slipping her arm through his. Come on, Jerry, she said urgently. We'll be late for our date. Jerry looked at her then at the hotel corridor behind her, then again at the waiting elevator. I have the oddest feeling something's wrong, he said. I... I don't remember coming over here for you. You didn't, she said promptly. I came for you, Jerry. This is your hotel, remember? Dr. Burgess said you'd had a bad shock, but I didn't know how bad till now. Shock? said Jerry. What shock? What was bothering me? Carol smiled tightly. Nothing. Nothing at all. Come on, Jerry, darling. Again, she drew him toward the elevator. If I could only remember, he said uneasily on the brink of that open cube of bright grayness. Then his eyes focused upon the brass buttons fronting the boy's jacket, and at his own shadow as it passed across those glowing hemispheres. As the shadow crossed a button, the color would die, and the button would be dull crystal and then glow bright and brassy again when the shadow had passed. Photoelectric cells, said Jerry. Light-sensitive cells. Those aren't buttons, they're eyes. Multiple robot eyes. He staggered away from the boy. Carol stopped him. The elevator boy, suddenly half again Jerry's height, was towering over him, long steel arms extending like hooked telescopes toward him. Get in, Jerry, get in! cried Carol, struggling to push him forward toward those invincible metal clamps. In a fury of fear, Jerry fought her, grappled with her, twisted to avoid those extending robot hands that would drag him to destruction. And suddenly Carol was screaming his name, and her eyes were pools of terror and betrayal, and the leaping metal fingers had buried themselves in the soft flesh of her shoulders and dragged her back into grayness. Incredible energies came alive about her, and then there was only a shimmer of dusty, crystalline winds, and she was gone. Jerry found himself standing before the still-warm plates of the atomic duplicator, 
in the room where Mawson had had his short-lived universe. Beside the machine, a squat cubic box dangled limp steel arms, its rows of photoelectric cells losing their golden glow. And then, as Burgess came hurrying in through the door, he toppled over in a dead faint. So there is no such person as Carol, said Burgess, standing at the foot of the hospital bed. She was only the figment of your imagination. Yes, said Jerry dully. And all along it was Mawson I was really with. He was clever, all right. She was certainly the last occupant of that crazy place I was likely to attack. If he had not tried attacking me himself, I might be atom dust by now. A little longer, and she... He, I mean, might have talked me into that elevator. Well, said Burgess, I'm sorry this thing ended with Mawson's dissolution, but that can't be helped. You did your job well, Lieutenant. Thanks, said Jerry, expressionlessly. To come so near death so many times, Burgess shuddered. You have a remarkable constitution not to have cracked under such a strain. Lieutenant, you're a lucky man. And Jerry, his mind is still filled with a vision of golden hair, soft brown eyes, and warm, eager lips, could only echo wearily, very lucky. Well, I'm sure you could feel a very 60s vibe in that story. It felt more like a trip on acid than a science fiction drama. I do applaud our reader, Ben, for capturing the feel of what I'm sure the author was going for. John Michael Sharkey was a writer who published over 80 plays, 50 stories in science fiction, and a number of full novels, many under pen names. Sharkey was born in Chicago, Illinois. In the 1960s, he worked at Playboy and edited the company magazine for Allstate Insurance. He published science fiction stories starting in 1959 under the name Jack Sharkey, with Captain of His Soul, which appeared in the magazine Fantastic. He eventually focused on plays, some of which included Dracula, the Musical, Book, Music, and Lyrics, 1984, and The Bride of Brackenlock, 1987. Sharkey wrote plays under his own name and four pseudonyms, Rick Abbott, Mark Chandler, Monk Ferris, and Mike Johnson. He truly was a visionary. Well, that was podcast number 635. I want to thank Abigail Atkinson, Bonnie Hernandez, Max Sweet 302, and Ben Tucker for their stories today. You made this podcast a podcast. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button helps us grow. Thank you for listening and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.